All right, I think we're good to go here. Something you would put like leftovers in. I think you set something up for this season or something. watching online today or maybe even watching this service weeks and months and years from now, uh, let's go to the Lord and thank Him for the opportunity to worship here together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You that we have a place to come into that's warm and, and has lights and we can have uh, musical instruments and, and all these things to, to lift up Your name. We're thankful for that. We're thank you. We thank you for the technology that we have that allows us uh, to, to be seen and heard by those that aren't here. And maybe even at a different time, someone will find us. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would speak to them through the songs and through your word that is preached. Pray that that technology would work and stay strong. Thank you. We are here, Lord, to lift up the name of, of you, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're here to be convicted, to be challenged, to grow closer to you, and to give you all of the honor and the glory forever and ever. Thank you, Lord. We love you, praise you, and we need you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand. Our call to worship is on the screen, and this morning it is a, a part of Psalm 36. You see there it is verses 5 through 10. Let's be called to worship by the word of God. Please join me. Thy steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, thy faithfulness to the clouds, thy righteousness is like the mountains of God, and thy judgments are like the great deep, man and beast thou saves, O Lord. How precious is thy steadfast love, O God, the children of men take refuge in the shadow of thy wings, they feast on the abundance of thy house. And thou gives them drink from the river of thy delights. For with thee is the fountain of life, and thy light do we see light. 
Oh, continue thy steadfast love to those who know thee, and thy salvation to the upright of our hearts. We're not used to using um, the Revised Standard Version. There's a lot of these and nows, and sometimes people don't like that, but they don't realize in older English, that's actually the, the familiar place. What an awesome thing this, to be familiar with the loving, creative, holy, holy, holy God by calling him thee and thou. Greet one another in the name of the Lord as we get ready to sing praise. Good morning, Lord. Amen. He works in our hearts so that we can turn to him and see the light, and he is our lighthouse.
praise God for songs about the light in the darkness of winter. Our, um, our confession of faith this morning is, is an ancient one. Our confirmation class will be looking at this this afternoon. Would you join me? In, is it on the screen, Lisa? Yeah, it's on the screen, and it's in your uh, bulletins. Would you join me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sat at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come and judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please take a moment for silent prayer and silent prayer of confession. <coughs> Good news, good news. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you are a new creation. In Christ, there is hope. Live today forgiven, free, and hopeful as you live today in Christ. Shout the good news. Let all those living in hope, forgiven and free, shout Hosanna. Hosanna. <laughs> Wow, it's the girls club today. Hi girls. How are you all? All right, what is this book I have here? The Bible. All right, there's a song about it, which you might know, I hope you know. You practiced it today? You definitely know it. All right, and I bet a lot of people out here know it. Did you, did you have motions? You did not. Okay, I don't either. <laughs> it goes like it goes like this: the B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B I B L E. Let's sing it one more time. The B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B I B L E. Bible. This is the Bible, and it's from God. God talks to us. Now, we just sang two songs that talked about light. Did you hear that? I saw the light. You're my lighthouse. Do you, do you guys know what a lighthouse does? Anybody know? What, what's it? It shines a light so um, the boats can get to shore. It shines a light so the boats can get to shore. Very good. What would happen if that lighthouse wasn't shining? They couldn't see, they might crash, it might be really bad. Well, 
I want you to always remember, we've talked about this before, um, but I'm not sure if everybody was here that day. This is Psalm 119, 105. Listen to what it says. Your word, God's word, the Bible, is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Just like the boats depend on that light to see where they're going, in our life, we know where to go and how to follow God by reading His Word. Can you remember that? All right, let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that your Word shines in our hearts and shows us how to follow you. It shows us your immense love and how you've done everything for us and how you are the one that, that gets all the honor and praise and glory. Thank you for these girls. I pray, Lord, that they will grow into godly women that, that follow you. And I look forward to watching them grow to be godly women as they learn about you and they follow you in all parts of their lives. Thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, girls, there's still some snacks, still some Play-Doh, some Hot Wheels. Enjoy. Thank you. Did you not? Oh, you are too recording. <clears throat> Sometimes I think we take those psalms for granted. Let's make sure we pass them on to the, to the next generation. Um, I say that because I was at a, an event this past week where we sang The Church's One Foundation. And it was a group of a Christian gathering, and there was a lot of people there that were not familiar with that hymn, The Church's One Foundation. To me, I was like, well, this is a very familiar. Everybody knows this. Not everybody knows it. So let's pass down those songs and the biblical truths to the next generation. All right, I'm going to invite you to turn to a book that you, uh, I'm sure, have read lots. The book of Nahum. Nahum in the Old Testament. Nahum chapter 1. And we're going to look just at verses 1 through 8 this morning. Uh, but before we look at Nahum 1 through 8, Let's go to the Lord in prayer again. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for what we sang a little bit ago. We only see the light because you work in our hearts. You are the standard. You are the light. And we thank you for that. Thank you for these girls and pray that they would continue to grow closer to you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today. You, you have an important thing to remind us about, and that is that, that by your grace we come into your presence. By your grace we are saved. You have paid the price for our sin on the cross, and you, you remind us of that through this Old Testament text that, that we're not all very familiar with. So I pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our minds, open the eyes of our hearts, that you would speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are my rock, you are my redeemer, and I pray that you would speak to your people through your word this morning. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, hear the word of the Lord. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Alkoshite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither 
and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, interesting passage. And an interesting three-chapter book that is actually pretty hard to read. But if you were here last week, you heard me say that for the next few weeks, we're going to look at this question. What can we learn from the 600s B.C.? And if you were here, I read some long passages out of the book of 2 Kings that talked about the spiritual situation of the nation of Israel, the people of God, in the 600s B.C. And in reality, it was a time of spiritual darkness. Of course, there was a remnant of faithful people that followed the Lord. There always is. But by and large, the people were full of idolatry. They were worshiping pagan gods and goddesses. And that all changed in 632 B.C. God brought revival through King Josiah. So that's kind of the context into which Nahum comes. And we're going to look at this Old Testament text today to think about a New Testament reality. As I was thinking and praying through this week and, and this text, I listened to a message by Alistair Bay. I highly recommend you always listen to Alistair Bay. And he was talking about, he was talking about something that, that I like to call the curse of Western Pennsylvania. And consequently, where I grew up, the curse of Northeast Ohio. And the, the curse I'm talking about is this. It's a misunderstanding of what Christianity is. It's thinking that Christianity is about what I do. If I do enough good, hopefully when I'm done here on earth, my good will outweigh my bad, and I'll go to heaven. It's a misunderstanding that's common to where I grew up, it's common to this area. It's the curse of Western Pennsylvania and Northeast Ohio, and Pittsburgh Dad captured it perfectly this week. If you're not familiar with Pittsburgh Dad, he makes videos on YouTube, and, and what, he's an actor who actually just remembered what it was like growing up in Pittsburgh and started acting like his dad, and he does these hilarious videos. But I think you can get an insight into how we, in general, think in this area through him. Because he put out a video this week, which was a prayer, calling on a higher power to help the Steelers win. <laughs> the prayer starts out like this. He's in the pew, and he says, God, Jesus, Holy Ghost, Patrick Swayze's ghost, Ghost Rider, you know what? Whoever else is up there. <clears throat> His request is that the Steelers will win. And he says this. I'm not saying I deserve this win. But when I saw that share if you like Jesus thing on Facebook, I shared it. <laughs> not just like, share. And at the end, he tells his family, oh, no, 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 no. We were just praying to the Catholic God. Now we have to go to the Methodist and the Presbyterian and the non-denominational so that all our bases are covered. <laughs> Blasphemous? Maybe. Instructive? Yes. 
He is a picture into to how we seem to think in this area. The, the, the air we breathe, the atmosphere that we are born in, it's sort of this idea of, God, I've done this, now you do that. And it's sort of this idea that we all have around us in the air that Christianity's motto is, do good and try harder. And I was reminded by the message of Alistair Begg this week, that is not the message of Christianity. The message of Christianity is not do good and try harder. It's God loves sinners. God loves sinners and he sent Jesus to pay the judgment for my sin and your sin so you and I can actually know God and be in a relationship with him where we are his sons and we are his daughters now and forever. So we're going to jump from this Old Testament passage to that reality this morning. And what I pray that you will see and hear is that Nahum's, visit, Nahum's vision of judgment reminds us that our judgment happened on the cross. Christ took it and gives us peace. May we walk in that peace. Nahum's vision of judgment reminds us that our judgment happened on the cross. Christ took it and gives us peace. May we walk in his peace today. I want to give you a little bit of background about Nahum and Nineveh. Nahum, we are told in, in verse 1, is an Elkoshite. He's from Elkosh. That's about all we know of. We know that he wrote this, he lived in the 600s B.C. In the book of Nahum, it talks about the falling of Thebes. Well, the city of Thebes fell in 663 B.C. It clearly tells us that his book is a prophecy about the fall of Nineveh, the judgment of Nineveh. We know that happened in 612 B.C. So somewhere in the mid-600s B.C., between 663 and 612, Nahum is coming about. Now remember, Israel's having a revival in 632. So they may have been very close in time together where the people of God are coming back to God and Nahum is saying, people of God, your enemy Nineveh will be judged. Nineveh itself was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The location of it is basically the location of modern Mosul, Iraq. And they caused nothing but pain and agony for the Israelites. If you want to put yourself in the shoes of the Israelites and how they felt toward the Ninevites, think of how you might have felt about the Japanese in 1941. Think about how we all felt about any nation that supported Osama bin Laden or harbored his people after 2001. That's how the Israelites felt about Nineveh. Now keep in mind, that explains why Jonah didn't want to go there. 100 to 150 years earlier, God says, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell those people to repent. And Jonah says, no, I don't like those people. Well, you know what happened to Jonah. And he does go, and they do repent. Listen to what happens in Jonah chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. When the king of Nineveh heard that Jonah was, what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, took off his royal robes, he dressed himself in burlap, and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. <clears throat> so Jonah preaches and the people respond. 
But it's now been 100, 150 or so years later, and they've returned to their wicked ways. And God sends a message of comfort to his people through a guy whose name actually means comfort. The word Nahum means comfort. And the comfort to these Israelites is Nineveh will be judged for its wickedness. Nineveh itself was a huge city. And for those of you that are doing the chronological Bible study, it's interesting to know it was founded by Nimrod. Do you remember reading about Nimrod in Genesis 10, verse 8? Cush was also an ancestor of Nimrod, who was the first heroic warrior on earth. Since he was the greatest hunter in the world, his name became proverbial. People would say, this man is like Nimrod, the greatest hunter in the world. He built his kingdom in the land of Babylonia, with the cities of Babylon, Erech, Hakkad, and Kalna. From there, he expanded his territory to Assyria, building the cities of Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin, the great city located between Nineveh and Kala. You will remember that Nimrod, Nimrod is from the line of Ham. Ham was the one of the three sons of Noah that did not act righteously toward his father, and consequently his line was cursed. Nimrod becomes the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and the people there became known for their brutality. This is kind of disturbing, but I, <clears throat> but I want you to hear it. You all remember reading about in history class relief sculpture. Things that archaeologists find that, that tell stories. Well, archaeologists have found these relief sculptures about the Assyrian Empire and the people of Nineveh. <clears throat> and this is what it says. These reliefs show bodies impaled on sticks. Tongues being cut out. People being led by lip rings. Heads being carried and piled up. Dismembered bodies with scattered limbs and severed heads serving as ornamental decoration on walls and structures and totem poles made of human heads. <coughs> nice people. Now, the archaeologists are quick to remind us, oftentimes, that people would brag in these sculptures because they wanted to intimidate their enemies. So maybe they weren't that bad, were they? I don't know, but they had the reputation for being a brutal people. And Nahum is bringing a message to the people of Israel, saying they will be judged. And the reason that God can give them that message is because he created them in the first place. He created all things. What can we learn from the 600 BC? God the Creator is judge. Verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He, met, he rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. The mountains quake before him. The mill, the hills melt away. The earth trembles. Why? Because God is the one who made it. And God is the one who's in charge. Psalm 24, 1 and 2, 1 and 2 tells us, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. What can we learn from the 600s BC? That this is God's planet, not ours. They needed to have a grasp on that. We need to have a grasp on that. They and we needed to understand that God is the one who deserves honor and glory and respect and praise, that we would actually listen to him. 
Today, whether you knew it or not, today around the, the country and I think the world is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. A day where we're reminded to fight for life because God is the creator of life. And some people hear that and they say, oh, Pastor Jefferson, don't get all political. It's not political. It's spiritual. It's our faith in God that we have a God who created life and you and I have no right to destroy it. You and I have no right to tear others down who are made in the image of God. But Pastor Jefferson, look what they've done. You and I have no right to tear others down who are made in the image of God, no matter how sinful they are. God is the creator. All nations ultimately owe him thanks and praise. And he desires that all people come to him. This God that we serve is holy, 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 and he is good and compassionate. Verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. You can see that in the Old Testament, that he's slow to anger. He gave them a chance to repent. He sent Jonah. And Jonah said, no, I don't like them. I don't want to go tell them about you, Lord. They don't deserve it. I wonder how often we are like that. The grace of, of, of God, grace, the, the love, you, you want me to share that with that person? I don't like them. He doesn't deserve it. I don't like her. She doesn't deserve it. <laughs> the whole point of our text today is neither do you. Neither do I. Neither do any of us. This God we worship is holy. 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 I'm not sure we can totally fathom his purity. The fact that no sin he can tolerate. Verse 3 says, the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. In our minds, we say, well, that was just a little sin, guilty. Well, I'm sure the Lord would understand guilt. Nineveh was guilty. Nineveh would be judged for its guilt. The scriptures, as we read them, bring us to this horrific conclusion. I am guilty. I must be judged. And that is why the gospel is such good news. The Lord is good, in verse 7, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. God is holy, 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 and he cannot have sin in his presence. And he so loved us sinful creatures that he gave us a sacrifice. Jesus. And the final thing to talk about this morning is how our judgment, my judgment, your judgment, happened at the cross. Every sinner deserves judgment. The book of Nahum is brutal as you read it. And you see that, that sin deserves judgment. And every sinner deserves judgment. And the cross tells us that that judgment was given out. That Jesus took it. He who knew no sin became sin. And you and I have nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with sharing, if you like, Jesus on Facebook. It has nothing to do with us trying to work our way to him. It has everything to do with what he has done. And the call to you and I is trust in that. And listen to the comfort. He cares for those who trust in him. If we trust in him, we trust in his way of providing relationship. And that was trusting that our judgment that we deserve was taken on the cross so that you and I can know him. 
Well, so what, Pastor Jefferson? What can we learn from the 600s BC? We can learn a lot. We can learn that God is the creator. And, and this is his plan. You and I live in a culture that is totally creature-centered. Our culture, if it allows God in at all, regulates him to the sidelines. We, the creatures, are the stars of this show. In our world, the created things, technology, science, human ingenuity, will solve everything. And the message that we see from Nahum is it's the other way around. The creator is the one who needs center stage. He is the one to be honored, praised, given glory. He is the one that gives out wisdom. He is the one that will solve the problem. We can learn from the 600s BC that, that God is serious about sin. It's scary to read that because he says sin must be judged you must be judged. And as far as I can tell, we have two options. One option is to try and withstand that judgment ourselves. Look at verse 6. Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. I don't want to try option one. Option two Trust in Christ, who did endure his fierce anger on the cross, who did take the wrath, so that you and I can be free. And finally, something we can learn from the 600, the message of the cross of Christ. The good news that we can be made right, even though we don't deserve it. Is for all of us Ninevites. It's for all of us Ninevites. So I pray that we will share. Pastor Jefferson, in the church, Nahum's vision of judgment reminds us that our judgment happened on the cross. Christ took it and gives us peace. May our response be Hallelujah. And may we walk in his peace today and always. Lord God, thank you. We don't understand because we, we are full of questions and we read Nahum and, and it's, it's brutal, Lord. And we are confronted with a God who takes sin very seriously, promises punishment for sin, and we're confronted with a God that says, I love you sinful people so much that I'm going to send my son Jesus in your place. Oh Lord, if we have that misunderstanding, or maybe we've ever had that misunderstanding, I know I had that misunderstanding in my young life. I thought this whole Christian life was all about me and what I did and didn't do and how good I could be. And Lord, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with me realizing that I'm lost, I'm a sinner, I deserve judgment. But you have given us a refuge. You have given an ark of salvation. And that refuge, that ark, is the cross of Jesus Christ. And when I'm covered with your blood, Lord, you see me through Christ, and that is undeserved, and that is amazing. Lord, if there's anybody here, maybe, that had that misunderstanding, and today your word has spoken to them, and cleared that up in their mind, and Lord, I pray that today is a day of salvation, that they would follow your message, Jesus, to turn, repent, and believe, trust in that good news. And that they realize that John, John says, as we trust in you, as we believe in you, we, we are a son or daughter of the living God. And then you call us to follow you. 
and to grow closer and be molded more and more into your image on a daily basis until we are with you in glory or until you come back and take us. Lord, for those that have understood that for years and decades, life is getting weird. It's getting very weird and crazy. Comfort us. Remind us that you are with us. You are taking us through every day. And you will carry us safely to shore. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We need you. We praise you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. I encourage you to read the rest of Nahum. We'll probably go to uh, Habakkuk next week. Um, or Zephaniah. I'm not sure exactly yet. But uh, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah is kind of where we're landing until Lent starts. And in Lent, we will pick back up in the Gospel of Mark and finish the Gospel of Mark as we head toward the celebration of what brought us freedom, that crucifixion and resurrection. We respond to God's word by going to him in prayer. John, it's good to see you awake. Good, good to see you awake. <laughs> It's good to see you, John. Good, good to see you here in your spot. We've been praying for you, and we're thankful to see you here. Um, please pray for uh, Marie. It's good to see you. We're praying for, well, Maria. And then Maria, it's good, it is good to see you. Welcome back. And then Marie's behind you and taking care of her sister. We're praying for your sister as well. If you would continue to pray, um, if you continue to pray for Penny, um, she would appreciate it, and uh, uh, as she continues to fight cancer like no one I've ever seen, lift her up, lift her up that, that the, the drugs they are trying and the combinations will do something, or that the Lord will take her cancer away, but lift her up and, and um, on a daily basis as you continue to do it. Anything else to lift up in prayer? Diana. So, um, Karen Trevor, who lives in Georgetown, um, probably beginning of January, she got really sick with COVID and was in the hospital. I think she's still there, but please pray for her recovery. Her last name is Trimmer? Mm -hmm. Karen Trimmer, okay. In the hospital and sick. Sure. Anything and else? Trimble, sorry. Trimble, okay. Anything else? We'll just pray for each other, check in on each other, as you all do. This congregation is, is wonderful about that. But pray for one another, check in one another over the next 24 hours. And, and if the weathermen are right, we could see a lot of white stuff. And if they're not, we won't see much of all. Um, but uh, pray for one another in, in that regard. Um, let's go to the Lord and pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the group of people in this room. I thank you, Lord, that uh, they want to honor you and lift up your name and make your name great and follow you in their life. And I pray for each one of their ministries. Yes, they have a ministry. Maybe it's taking care of the kids. Maybe it's running a business. Maybe it's working the land. Maybe it's flying an airplane. Maybe it's taking care of a loved one. Maybe it's teaching school. Maybe it's making music. Lord, you have given each person in this room a ministry. And I thank you for it. And I pray, Lord, that you would use people in this room in, in a mighty, mighty way. Lord, that you would shine through them and people would see you. Lord, we cast our cares upon you. Almost every time the preschool kids come in this room, we sing a song that goes, cast your burdens onto Jesus for he loves us all. And that doesn't just go for preschoolers, that goes for all of us, Lord. So we lift up care to you. We lift up Penny to you. Lord, oh, I pray that you would, would take this cancer away, that you would bring healing in her body 
And, and Lord, I am so thankful for the inspiration she is to each one of us. And Lord, uh, she knows this, but deep in her being, remind her that you are with her every step of the way. We lift up to you, Mitzi. We lift up to you, Betty. We thank you for safe travel. We thank you for bringing uh, Maria home safely from a very far distance. We thank you for bringing John back to us and pray that you continue to give him strength. Pray for Marie's sister and thank you, Lord, that she um, is caring for her so well. And just ask for your mercy in that situation. Lord, there are so many that are, are sick with all kinds of different things, Lord. And our country is, is just in this crazy place. We ask for your wisdom. James tells us if we ask you for wisdom in faith, then you will give it without scolding us. Give us wisdom, please. Give us wisdom. Bring your patience and your peace and your joy. Thank you. We pray for the leaders of our country, of our state, of this area. We pray for those who serve our country and are away from their families. And we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, particularly those who are persecuted. Lord, on this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, we pray for those who work at, at Choices. And I thank you for that ministry and that we've got the opportunity to support them in the walk and in the baby bottles and in so many different ways. And we lift them up as they herald the, the voice for life. And we know, Lord, that they are busy on a regular basis, so we lift them up to you. And Lord, we're mindful that as we talk about that subject, it's possible, certainly, that that, that brings feelings of, of shame and, and hurt. And we ask that there would be grace and forgiveness and mercy and joy. That you are the God that can take any situation and bring redemption about. So thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are here. Lord, I would personally like to see there be no snow. I don't think that's probably what you're going to do. Um, we will thank you for whatever you give us, but we do ask you to keep people safe on the roads as they travel to and from work. We pray for those that will be plowing. We pray for the volunteer firemen and women that may have to respond to some calls. Then we pray for your mercy that you would take us safely through the storm. And you will. And Lord, we thank you for this community. We love you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Can't pray for him to win, even though Ryan wants them to. <laughs> but we do thank the Lord for him. We respond to God's word by giving, by giving of our, our time, um, the abilities he's given us, and the resources he's given us in the first place. So I'd invite the ushers to come forward and receive the tithes and offerings given in faith. <laughs>
Thank you, Lord, for these gifts that have been given. I pray, Lord, that you would provide for every need of your people. And we pray that the message of Jesus, the grace and mercy that we are given that we don't deserve, might go out throughout western Pennsylvania in your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Real quickly, I invite you to look at your um, can of our happenings. Next Sunday is our second congregational meeting of the month. And um, that is for the purpose of receiving the budget and uh, voting on the 2022 pastor's terms of call. So I hope you will plan to be here, Lord willing, for that. Confirmation class, you know, if you're in that, our meeting is today at 2, and Lord willing, we'll be done before the snow starts falling. We should be done by about 3 or 3.15 at the latest. We had an incredible, incredible Bible study Tuesday. At least I think we did. Uh, the chronological Bible study has started. If you might say, well, I didn't start. You can still join us. Um, I have copies in the office of the, the readings. You don't have to have the Bible. It's nice because it has everything marked by the day. But you can use your own Bible and read through the readings. Uh, so if you'd like to join us, we'll be meeting at 5 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall on Tuesday. Um, our service at Lakeview Nursing Home, Lord willing, as long as, as far as I know right now, is um, on the 30th at 3 p.m. I'll try and confirm that this week. Um, we are doing our best to help out Mill Creek with their ministry called Kids Bible Club. So there's a sign-up sheet out there if you would like to help make food. If you'd like to help make food, Put your name and the, and the date on there. There's a space on the sheet on top if you'd like to help be the ones giving out the food that day. Um, and they also could use help in other different ways. So there's some other things if you're available or feel called to that. Um, if you're working directly with the kids, you need to make sure you have all your Pennsylvania clearances. Um, Dana would like to make a, a nursery sign-up. So you see there if it says... If you have a desire to help out, please sign up on the bulletin board. Um, we have a food cupboard. There's not a whole lot in it right now. Um, if you feel led to bring something and put it back there, do so. If you need something and you find it back there, that's what it's for. It's for our congregation to help one another. So check that out if you could use some food. Um, the final thing that I will say is that we, we do our preschool registration for next year, believe it or not. We do that in, in three phases. And the first phase is the current students get to the first choice. So thinking that the three-year-olds can move up to the four-year-old class. So that registration for current students will be open this week. Next week, I will be telling you that if you have friends or family that, that you would like to register, they can do that week. And then the third week, it'll open to the general public uh, for whatever spaces are left. So, believe it or not, we're preparing and registering for next school year. So be praying for that process and letting, if you know of an incoming three or four year old uh, for next year, next week, uh, they'd be able to register. Anything I'm missing or I needed to announce and didn't, Diane? So, Deacon's meeting today after church in the library. Deacon's meeting today in the library. Thank you. Ray. I want to get off the tree and the church early next time. Let's go stop. Dinner here was great. Very few people that have all their family on each other. And it's amazing. We are having two new men. And the date's already been moved up on when they back close or twice now. So we're going to not stop open. You have to go up. You have to go to the morning. And we're going to open to you. I'll be back to you so I can stop. Because he's the only one in Ruth's family that they're going to have to have. Well, praise God. Thank you, God. All right, we'll be praying for that. And, and you're, you're welcome. I'm glad you could use this. And, and it smelled good, so you might have some more creamers next year that, that, that want to join. Anything else? 
Our closing hymn is a, is a great old one, reminding us that, again that, that it's not us creatures that this thing's about called life. It's the Creator that gives it to us. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing together. share that with the Ninevites around us now and always. Now receive the benediction. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.